गुड आफ्टरनून जिसली एम आई ऑडिबल प्रोफेसर सर है जॉइंट जिसली या सर ओके ओके hi everyone we'll start the session in 2 minutes waiting for some more participants to join I request everyone to please switch on your video so that we can see the students in the classroom. And please uh, switch off your uh, mics. Please keep yourself on mute. However, you can switch off your camera so that we can see the students in the class. Uh, good afternoon professor somak sir this is gopal krishna deputy commissioner from hyderabad hello good afternoon very nice to see you yeah nice meeting you good afternoon everyone welcome to the fifth session of interaction with india science seniors and uh, in the last session uh, we have interacted with dr m muruganandan and today we have with us professor soma prai choudhary vice chancellor ashoka university he is the former director of inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics pune and uh, welcome to the session sir uh, i would request gopal krishna sir deputy commissioner project coordinator for vigyan jyoti to give a brief introduction of our speaker yeah yeah thank you yeah, am i audible yes sir you are audible yeah good afternoon to all of you it is with great pleasure i welcome you all in the session 5 of the interaction with india science geniuses we are extremely fortunate to have among us an eminent astrophysicist professor somak rai choudhury and it is my proud privilege to introduce him to you iske sath professor somak rai choudhury is currently the vice chancellor of ashoka university in sonepat haryana in last year he was the director of the inter university academy and professor that is uca pune 
and it is my privilege to introduce him to all of you dr somak rai choudhury graduated from presidency college university of calcutta and went on to study physics at trinity college university of oxford he did his phd in astrophysics at the university of cambridge uk he then moved to the harvard smithsonian center for astrophysics at cambridge where he worked for a nasa project as part of the team that built the chandra x-ray observatory which is now in orbit after teaching for 12 years at the university of birmingham uk he moved back to india in 2012 to help rebuild presidency college kolkata into presidency university where he was dean of science and professor and head of physics he moved to pune in 2015 as the fourth director of iucaa which is one of the top research institutions in astrophysics in the world earlier this year he became the vice chancellor of ashoka university his work involves a wide range of topics in cosmology and astrophysics and has made seminal discoveries using observations at radio optical and x-ray frequencies from the ground and from space it is very interesting to note that he pioneered the study and also made discoveries of galaxy superclusters as the largest structures in the universe which includes the discovery of the saraswati supercluster of galaxies he has been in leading positions in several of india's mega science international projects including the 30 meter telescope and ligo india he is involved in in developing machine learning algorithms for astronomical data mining he has published over 80 research papers in peer reviewed scientific journals and also leads a substantial outreach programs involving st school students teachers and other citizens we are very much thankful to him for accepting this inv invitation in spite of his busy schedule as the vice chancellor professor somak as you would be aware The Vigyan Jyoti program is a flagship initiative of the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. The program is running successfully in collaboration with Navodaya Vidyalaya Samiti in 250 Jawhar Navodaya Vidyalayas all over the country. This program is a huge step in the direction of empowering girl students between 9th and 12th standards in STEM. that is science technology engineering and mathematics fields especially in those areas where women are underrepresented to achieve this the dst has mandated several activities for girl students for the cultivation of a stem mindset such as tinkering activities experiential learning hands on sessions coding sessions science camp visit to science and technology institutions institutions and research labs and one of the most important and having the potential to change mindsets is interactions with the role models we are conducting the lecture series interaction with india's science geniuses with eminent scientists of the country to help nurture and inspire the young girls today is the fifth lecture of the series and i hope it will be a turning point in the lives of many girl children touching them how to uh, take small steps for developing love for science technology astrophysics and the like i also hope such lectures will help to drive curiosity among the vigyan jyoti girls to know our place in the universe which may then turn into a big step in their lives vigyan jyoti scholars across the country are eagerly waiting to hear from you about your life and the amazing work that you are being part of in the field of astrophysics therefore i would now like to hand over the session to you professor somak please excuse me sir sir you are on mute yeah can you mute the others thank you very much uh, uh, mr gopalkrishnan thank you for 
this wonderful introduction to me and uh, for inviting me to this uh, this program this is a wonderful initiative for empowering and in uh, inspiring um, uh, students in particular girl students to come to stem this is the time has come in india to for uh, women to step up into academia and uh, take control of various research projects and uh, and academic projects that's happening all over the country um in it will be led by young people and of course uh, half of the population of india uh, um, are girls and we should uh, encourage everybody to come in and i'm going to talk a little bit about um, how i got to become a scientist uh, and you will see that it really matters uh, to go have mentors and people who can inspire you uh, to um, to do this work i mean i grew up in kolkata um, my father was a um, uh, literature professor my mother was a sanskrit teacher so um, um, and a lot of people had done science in my family but they had been doctors and engineers um, and i decided to go into uh, pure science partly because my mother through her deep knowledge of sanskrit and the scriptures knew the sky very well and and she would show me the sky and i would know the names of all the nakshatras and the um, and the stars and was very very curious about the sky from a very very early age but the most important thing happened was that i went to a very very good school and i'm going to talk to you about um, my my mentors uh, in the next few uh, slides i'm going to share my screen so that i can show you some pictures So the school, I get, you you can see my slide, right? Is that all? No, no, that day ni man, that day ni man ki sir. You can, yeah, please. And can you please, uh, uh, other people, your uh, microphones, please? Thank you. So I went to this school called Saint Xavier's College School in Kolkata. I mean, hey, two brands, hey, nee, abhi dwadi ke chakkar mein do chale gaye. And ye aur chala jaye. It it. I I've been to some really old institutions this uh, school was established in the 1850s a missionary school in Kolkata uh, has produced some really amazing uh, people all through its um, history not only sportsmen like Shourab Ganguly and uh, business people like Lakshmi Mittal but also seminal scientists including as you will see Jagadish Chandra Bose but the most important thing was that we had some really great teachers in the school and in particular science teachers who were very very uh, inspiring um for us to take up mathematics and science and one of the most important people who had a very important uh, influence in my life was father goro who um had in his youth become been a direct student of albert einstein when uh, he he uh, was a student at the sorbonne in paris and he was teaching in kolkata and he um, not only wrote little books like this but he took us up to the telescope sensevius had one of the rare things in the entire country and had an observatory uh, on the top of the roof of uh, the uh, the school and this was established by father eugene lafon in the 1850s the observatory and it is uh, one of the oldest telescopes in india which was on the roof of my school and uh, father lafon of course is a very famous scientist himself and he was the teacher of jagadish chandra bose in st xavier's um uh, of course in the uh, 19th century as you can see i i put jogi very famous scientist in india um can you hear me yes sir so, can you hear so um uh, would take us to the roof and and show us how to use the telescope and in the evening we saw uh the planets and saturn in particular through the telescope that had a in, very very important um uh, effect on my life it, very early on if there are mentors who can show you things that are outside your your syllabus and to show that you can do things with instruments which are uh, it it makes a very very big difference i'm very proud that later in life when i became the dean of presidency college i was asked to uh by my school to inaugurate this observatory which is now called father lafon observatory which is still in sensevia school and i went back to inaugurate this uh this revised uh, observatory 
Um, then um, I, uh, as an undergraduate, I went to Presidency College in Kolkata, which is also one of the most important uh, institutions in India, oldest uh, college in India, 1817, it was established. And there you see some people coming back in my life. And this was Jagadish Chandra Bose, uh, who I mentioned in the first uh, um, um, uh, slide, who was, uh, of course, uh, a student in St. Xavier's. Uh, but he became, as you know, the person later on who would um, invent microwaves, who would discover microwaves and make the first microwave uh, apparatus, a wireless transmission and all that after him a professor at this place in Presidency College, right? And he built the Department of Physics, um, which um, uh, in the host, please disable uh, people writing on the screen. You can do that there. Thank you. Um, uh, the Baker Laboratories, where um, I studied as a, uh, as a student, we had some amazing professors, Professor Ramul Rajuri, for example, who was uh, one of the countries and the world's leading relativists, uh, who also talked about astrophysics in class. Um, uh, in the later on, when I became a professor and head of uh, the physics department, this was my department. And in fact, I became the head of physics, which a hundred years before me, Jagadish Chandra Bose was. So uh, it was a privilege for me to sit in his chair when I became a teacher later on in the same department. The department was very inspiring for not only having inspiring teachers, but also the library was fantastic. It opened up a, a lot of uh, uh, vistas for us in, uh, in looking at various, uh, um, uh, various research that's going on. At the same time, I got a scholarship. Like very much a lot of people here um, um, are, are recipients of the Vigyan Jyoti Scholarship. I got a scholarship called the Jagadish Bose National Science Talent Search Scholarship, you know, the JB and SDS. So that's uh, uh, also, again, Jagadish Bose coming up in my life, the same person. And in that scholarship, one of the first things they did, as, um, um, as Mr. Gopal Krishnan mentioned, it is very important for uh, scholars who have been identified, people who have science talent who have been identified, like a lot of you, um, it is important for them to see the world, to meet um, scientists and go and visit laboratories. This was in 1982. And as early as that, we were taken uh, all around India on our, our pilgrimage to visit some of the top research institutions in India. And uh, as a second year undergraduate in college, I was asked, uh, um, I was taken to this amazing place uh, again, Jagadish Bose National Science Talent Search, as I said, I got the scholarship, this amazing place called Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. And in Bengaluru, uh, which was called Bangalore, then the Raman Research Institute, the director then was uh, Professor V. Radhakrishnan, who was C.V. Raman's son. And uh, I met them. And um, in that, during that visit, one of the professors there, uh, Professor G. Srinivasan, uh, who, uh, of course, uh, and is an amazing astrophysicist who's still uh, giving amazing talks. Um, he gave a lecture to us uh, in the evening. The lecture lasted three hours. And that lecture was about the discovery of millisecond pulsars. Pulsar, uh, these are stars that are moving a thousand times in one second. So fast. And this had just been discovered. And he told us how he thought these things work. As a second year undergraduate, it completely opened my mind. I, I could not, there was no turning back from that moment. I knew what I wanted to do. And I would say, all of you, keep your mind open because this point will come in your life when you know what you want to do with your life. And you know exactly that this is, this is the most inspiring moment. So this is, um, Professor Ji Srinivasan essentially was, and then when I, when I wrote back to him saying, please, I want to come and work with you, I was still in college and he let me come in the summer and work with him uh, and to do some research uh, as a, an undergraduate student. Uh, so later on, I then moved to Trinity College uh, in, uh, in the University of Oxford. I got an INLAX scholarship, uh, which is uh, available to everybody. In fact, I now sit on the committee for giving out INLAX scholarships. And there are 15 to 20 scholarships given for anybody to study anywhere in the world. This was in the 1980s when I got the scholarship to go to Oxford University. Some of the major people who inspired me there were I, I went and attended a lot of mathematics lectures by Roger Penrose, who, as you know, got the Nobel Prize two years ago. 
Um, I also, even though I was a physics student there, I attended some of the economics lectures of Amartya Sen, who later became a Nobel laureate also, as you know. So uh, Oxford uh, was a very, very inspiring place for me, just opened my mind. And this is the first place where I formally started doing astrophysics. I took up astrophysics as a part of my course. And so now, at that time in India, not many universities taught astrophysics. I could do that because I went to Oxford. Now, for a lot of people here uh, who want to do astrophysics, many, many universities actually give courses in astrophysics uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level, including the university I'm teaching at now, Ashok. So um, then I went to the University of Cambridge. Of course, as you know, University of Cambridge is famous for Newton. But the interesting thing is I got a scholarship which supported me there. I, my parents, of course, could not afford me to go to University of Cambridge. Uh, was uh, not only named after Isaac Newton, but it was Isaac Newton's own money. When Isaac Newton died, he was a bachelor. He left all his money to the university. That money is now given out as a scholarship to foreign students. And I got a scholarship to study in, uh, um, in Cambridge and do astrophysics. And the, the main people who inspired me, of course, you see, I, I've given the picture of Professor Donald Lyndon Bell, who was my supervisor, amazing astrophysicist. He's the man who worked out that actually the um, uh, there are supermassive black holes in the middles of galaxies and uh, a, a, a wonderful person who passed away a few years ago. Uh, um, but the first set of lectures that I attended there in Cambridge was a lecture on the on cosmology and the state of the universe by Stephen Hawking, who, uh, who was giving a series of lectures called A Short History of the Universe, A Short History of Time, which became a book called A Brief History of Time later on. And later on, I, I attended lectures on black holes by Stephen Hawking. And that became, again, a life changer for me. The way uh, one needs to focus on certain things. I knew that I wanted to work on galaxies, working with Lyndon Bell. And I knew I wanted to work with black holes when I attended Stephen Hawking's lectures. Uh, both these people are no longer with us, but they form uh, one of the, the, the core of, of my inspiration. After Cambridge, I studied, I did my PhD in Cambridge. I taught there for a little while. And then I moved to um, uh, Harvard University in the US, uh, where um, I, I actually went I, as an optical astronomer. I went to work with a lot of telescopes all over the world. The professional telescopes are on the top of the highest mountains in the world, and they're in the middle of deserts. So um, the best places to work are in Chile, for example, in South America, where I've been many times. Some of the best telescopes are there in South Africa, in Australia, and in Hawaii. Uh, some, and on the La Palma Islands uh, in, uh, uh, off the coast of, um, of Europe. So these are some of the best places where I've been and worked. One of my most favorite places, of course, is the MMT Observatory. Here I'm giving you spent long, long nights, many months working there um, uh, in, in Arizona, which belonged to Harvard. Then uh, I got involved in a NASA project to build an X-ray telescope, which, uh, was, uh, which uh, was named after the Indian astronomer Chandrasekhar. Uh, called Chandra, which was built to detect black holes in, in space. And this was launched in 1999. And I uh, was part of the team that built some of the instruments for this uh, space observatory. This got me into space astronomy. And even now I work a lot on astronomical observatory in space. So I work with telescopes both on, um, on, on the ground and in space. Um, so after um, uh, I, I spent quite a lot of time in the US working there, I came back to work in, uh, in Pune uh, at the in, uh, Inter University Center of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Ayuka, where I worked for five years as a, a junior uh, a professor, assistant professor. Uh, and then I went back again to England to teach at the University of Birmingham. But in at the uh, Ayuka, when I came back there as director in, for the last seven years, uh, the 12 years I worked here was wonderful. This is a, a research institute in India, which was built for to, to inspire teachers uh, in India, uh, college teachers, to do research in astronomy and then um, pass that on to their students. So we, uh, in, in, during this time, we interacted with a lot of students and a lot of universities, and we set up different departments within Indian universities where astronomy is now taught. So due to the efforts of Ayuka, now astronomy is taught, astronomy astrophysics is taught in almost um, 100 universities in India now, in some way or the other. Where when I was a student, 
Um, this was not taught, uh, you know, probably four or five universities taught astronomy, astrophysics at that time. So uh, a wonderful place set up by Professor Jan Nalikar. Uh, and now it is in its, is, uh, in, in, in its uh, uh, 35th year almost um, doing a wonderful job. So, um, uh, and it's a center for astronomical research all over the world. And now uh, I have, uh, I'm now the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University in Sonepat, which is north of Delhi. And here we have a fantastic science department where we're setting up, it's only 10 years old, the university, and we have um, a physics department where there's a, undergraduates can do astronomy, astrophysics uh, as a minor, as well as uh, we have chemistry, uh, sci um, uh, you know, biology and, and, and computer science, but there are all, all the other subjects together. And here, one of the interesting thing is uh, liberal arts and sciences means that one can uh, look at uh, uh, different subjects together. So you can study history and astronomy together. You can study history and biology together. You can study sociology and, and chemistry together, and things like that. So that's the, the very interesting thing where we're looking at. Uh, and 60% and of our students are women, are, are girls. So that is uh, another very interesting uh, direction in which our country is going. A lot more uh, of, of girls students are coming into science. So um, this is my journey all the way. And I, I wanted to tell you how, uh, what kind of institutions I went to and the roles some of the people played in my life, not just people who I interacted with, people who are associated with the institution, like I said, in my school, the tradition of my school and college of the older generations that set up the infrastructure to which I went was very, very important. And I can talk about this later on if you want. Um, shall I pause here or shall I talk a little bit about my work? I'm asking the organizers. Uh, so you can talk about your work. Good. I'll, yeah, I'll just continue here and I'll talk a little bit. Uh, I've done quite a lot of things of, in astronomy all through my life. But one of the major things that I did when I started my career was to look at where we are in the universe, right? So one, one of the questions is, you know, just like you know that we are in India, a country which is in the world, um, uh, in, in the world where there are continents and there are uh, oceans and then uh, people go out, went out and, and figured out how um, the uh, the different places are, where the, where the different people live in the universe, uh, in, in, on the earth, and you know where you are with respect to the earth. You can ask the question, where is the earth in the universe? And this is one of the things that people were trying to discover uh, not very long ago. I mean, we actually knew about the universe only less than 100 years ago. And uh, uh, before that, it, people didn't know that we live in a galaxy and, uh, um, and the, uh, our, our star is in a star in a galaxy and things like that. So astrophysics is a very new subject. And one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out where in the universe we lie. So he, here you are. If you look at, for example, uh, the sky, it looks like this. You see a lot of stars, right, with the naked eye. But if you take a small, big, small bit like this and expand it and take a big telescope and look at that in great detail, say the Hubble Space Telescope or something like that, you will see that that blank space is just full of these fuzzy little objects. And these are actually we call galaxies. And each of these have millions and billions of stars in them. In fact, in this picture, everything is a galaxy. Only there are two stars which are marked with a cross, right? So just going from a naked eye picture of the, of the sky to something through a telescope, you can see, you can look through. And, and the fact that these are galaxies and these, these galaxies have lots and lots of stars in them, we only started understanding in the 1930s, less than 100 years ago, you have to understand. So this is a young subject, and this is the beginning of astrophysics rather than astronomy, uh, where we are trying to understand the universe through the application of the laws of physics that we learn in school, right? We learn physics in the laboratory, then we say, okay, how does this work? What is a star? What is a galaxy? How old is this universe? And things like that. So that's the kind of thing I'm very interested in to figure out. So our galaxy um, is, is, looks like this. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way. Uh, we all often call it Akash Ganga. And uh, you'll see in a minute why it's called Akash Ganga. But um, this is what uh, it looks like. Sorry. This is what it looks like from the top. Uh, it, it is a flat galaxy with lots of spiral structure. And if you look at from the side, it is very flat. It's like a chapati with a bulge in the middle. And here you are, you can see we're not in the middle of this galaxy. We are set aside to one side. And that's where the sun is. And a planet around the sun is the Earth. 
right? And so this eight kiloparsecs means 25,000 light years. So it takes 25,000 years for light to come from the center of the galaxy to us. It is that far away, right? And us meaning the sun and, and the planets around it. So this is a very, very uh, far away uh, from the center of the galaxy. And that's where we are. And because we live in a, in a, in a, uh, in a place like that, in a, um, in, in, a, in a thin layer of stars, when we look out, we see the stars in the sky. So all the stars we see in the sky are in this region. But if we look towards the middle of our galaxy, we see it as a band in the sky. As you can see, this is a picture from Chile, where actually you see this much better in the, from the Southern hemisphere. And you can see that this is a real picture. And, uh, and you can see the, the middle of the galaxy. And that's why it's called a Ganga. It's, it's like a river of stars, right? And uh, then that is because what is happening here is that, that you're looking through, looking in this direction. I don't know whether you can see my arrow. You, you're looking towards the center of our galaxy. And so you see it as a, as, a, as a band in the sky. And if you're looking the other way, you see the other stars in the sky, right? And that, that belongs in that little, little, uh, little layer, okay? So this is a real picture as you can see. And, and so there, and you can see that we are in a galaxy now. The nearest galaxies are, are these things, for example, there are tiny galaxies, there are moon galaxies. Our galaxy is the Milky Way, but there are little galaxies that are going around it, like the Earth has a moon, or Saturn has about 100 moons that go around it. The satellite galaxies, this one is, for example, called the Magellanic Clouds, which you can see with the naked eye. This you can see with normal eye uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. From India, you can't see it. It's too far away. It's below the horizon, right? And that's why I showed you a picture taken from South America. So this is our galaxy. Now, there, there are lots and lots of... So the universe, as we learned in 1930s and 1940s, less than 100 years ago, is made of galaxies. And inside the galaxy are these billions of stars, like these. And this, sometimes the galaxies are, 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 are merging with each other, playing with each other, uh, interacting with each other, uh, and, uh, um, and, and things like that, right? So here is uh, the, the local map. I said, I'll tell you what where we are in the universe. Here's the Milky Way with lots of little galaxies around it, right? And this is only a few. There are 40 or so we know of, which are our satellite galaxies. And then there's the Andromeda galaxy, which is also um, uh, another big galaxy with lots of lo little galaxies around it. And they are falling towards each other. And one of the first things I did as a PhD student in Cambridge was work out what is going to happen to these two galaxies. And my first paper was written about how these two galaxies are coming towards each other. And I worked out that it'll take about 4 billion years. And that is uh, 4,000 million years uh, uh, to, for them to come together and merge, right? They'll come together and merge and become one single galaxy. So that's, that's the kind of very interesting thing that you can do. You can do computer simulations that allow you to do this. And I'm, I'm going to pass on. So then you look at what, what, what does it look like over the universe? And we now know that the, if you look at on a large scale over the universe in the last 10, 20, 30 years, we are looking at making maps of galaxies. It looks like this. It's very much a filamentary structure. And galaxies are, are, are distributed all over the universe uh, on these filaments. And we're trying to figure out why they uh, on the large scale the structure looks like a spider's web. And uh, so we call this a cosmic web. And the galaxies lie on the cosmic wave and move around on the web, go around. And so you can ask the question, and this is one of the questions I asked when I was a, a, a student, uh, how large can these structures get? How large are these webs? Do they go all across the universe? So we learned that galaxies live in clusters. There are thousands and thousands of galaxies. They live in clusters. And then clusters live in clusters of clusters, which we call super clusters. This is one of the things that was mentioned when I was introduced, that one of the first things that I did as a young astrophysicist was introduce this concept of super clusters. And when I was one of the first people who worked on the concept of super clusters and found some of the largest structures that exist in the universe of galaxies. They're made out of tens and 20,000, 40,000, 50,000 galaxies. Uh, or even more, and, and they, they, they are in this kind of large structures going across. And for example, uh, one of the first things that we found um, was something that I call the Shapley supercluster, 
which I discovered while I was a PhD student. I've done work on it all through my life. This is, has uh, uh, more than 10,000 galaxies and, uh, and uh, has a, a big structure that, uh, that can be mapped out. And uh, it, you can see how galaxies grow. They form in there, they grow large and, and how, how they're born and how they evolve. All that can be done. And this is all, this was, um, in, as you can see, uh, about 20 years ago, we started working on this and we've been working on such things. And this led to, uh, as was mentioned, so you can now people, if you go to Wikipedia, you can see pictures like this where people are all discovering now different kinds of superclusters. And here we are right in the middle of kind of a sphere. And you can see around us are these big structures of galaxies called superclusters. And you have uh, uh, you know, you, in this, you can see the Coma supercluster, there's the Shapley supercluster, now Hercules, people give them names. Uh, these are structures of, um, of, of galaxies. And uh, a few years ago, we discovered one of the biggest such superclusters. I think it is now the biggest that has been found, the biggest structure of galaxies, and that is called the Saraswati supercluster. We, uh, I, with some of my colleagues he, in, in Ayuka in Pune, found this, and then it is uh, um, it has uh, 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 forty massive clusters in it and spans a very large um, uh, part of the sky. And so we are now discovering more and more bigger and bigger and bigger uh, structures. And and the question then is how big can these things get? Now this caught the uh, imagination of the newspapers. The newspapers published a lot of uh, um, uh, pictures of it. Um, the reason we called it Saraswati is because you remember we call our own galaxy Akash Ganga. And it's, it's we, we call it the river in the sky. Saraswati is a mythical river that was lost and we cannot find it anymore. And we thought this is this could be named after Saraswati. But, you know, I mean, if you attend lectures like this, you can sometimes get some advantage other than learning about astrophysics. For example, if this man had attended my lectures, he would have won Kon Banega Kroorpati in 2017. This was the last question, which was up for one crore rupees by Amitabh Bachchan. And he asked this question, and the man who was there couldn't answer. He lost. And of course, if you know, if he'd knew, known about our paper, he would have, he would pick the right answer, right? So sometimes um, uh, people out there um, in television or in the newspapers uh, do pay attention to what astronomers and astrophysicists are doing, but there you are. So that's one of the things that I, I work on. I'm going to stop here and, and see whether um, uh, people have questions to ask me. So thank you very much for listening to me. So thank you for sharing your work and telling us about your education yeah. and journey. Uh, so now like you this entire journey, it would not have been without challenges and problem. You would have faced various challenges and problems. So can you please tell us about that, about some of the challenges that you faced in this journey and how you overcame that so that our students will be. See, the, uh, um, thank you very much for asking that. And, and of course, uh, uh, you know, no life is without challenges. Um, and uh, everybody has a different challenge. I mean, I was very fortunate that I had no problem in coming into the career that I, um, um, I, I did because I had full support of my family, uh, even though uh, my father wanted me to be a lawyer. Uh, I, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, but when I said that I wanted to be a scientist, they did not object. There are a lot of people have problems in their house. So that's different. I, I was very fortunate I did not have that. I was very fortunate to have some very inspiring teachers. But of course, one of the most important things that you uh, uh, have at the beginning is to have which to make connections uh, with the right people. And uh, now there is internet, now there is uh, email, now there, is, uh, uh, there are ways of connecting with people through WhatsApp and, uh, and, and mobile phones. Remember, I'm talking of growing up in the 1970s, 80s, when we didn't have mobile phones, we did not have, um, we did not have uh, 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 um, the internet. And, and so one of the first things one had to do was to learn uh, how, to, um, uh, how to communicate, how to um, uh, have access to knowledge. 
uh, and a wonderful library we did have. But the first challenge I had was to learn how to use computing. And that is actually a, one of the major things that you have now. In those days, computers were not, um, you know, uh, things that were on the on the desk. They were large room size things, and you needed to learn how to um, how to how to program them. And and uh, this I had to learn by myself. So this was a big challenge uh, because we were not taught such things in school. So I'm now a student in classes taught computers and computer programming, etc. But there are other things they have to learn. So the first challenge is to learn the skills that you need to do your work. You, you might need, for each of you, it would be a different skill. It could be language. It could be writing in English or writing in Hindi, or it could be um, expressing yourself, uh, coming in front of people and giving a talk. So these are all skills that are needed. These are general skills. And I thought, well, because I had, uh, all these opportunities with great teachers and great family, those were not my problems. My problem was to figure out how to acquire the skills I needed to learn uh, to do astrophysics. And the two things I, I, I thought were important were learning how to use computers, which I had to learn myself and I had to go to computer class and, and, and learn to teach. Even when I went abroad, this computing was not taught in class, even in England. So I had to go and learn uh, things from computer classes uh, separately. And then I had to realize that I had to learn much more mathematics than I knew. So that I, so outside my classes, I started going to mathematics classes and learning mathematics. So th these were big challenges. Later, I mean, I, later the challenges were um, um, to um, then um, work in India uh, as opposed to working abroad. What happened was, that uh, when I worked uh, in the US or in the UK as a research student or as a scientist, one had access to a lot of facilities, uh, had to access a lot of money to, um, to go to these facilities. Uh, working um, back in India, when I first came back, was very, very challenging because these facilities were not there. And so one had to find ways of gaining access to these facilities. This is changing very fast. So the students who are listening to me now will have a different set of challenges in terms of working, even working in India and, and, and gaining access to knowledge in India. But in my case, it was gaining access to international facilities, gaining access to international um, uh, scientists and, and forums and things like that. Um, I, I, it, it would be very interesting to see what challenges um, the students coming up now will have they will be very different because they grew up in a in a in a uh, in an era where information is everywhere, instrumentation is everywhere, and so the challenges will be slightly different from the challenges I faced. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your insights on this. And uh, yes, you told correctly that wherever we want to work, we need to learn that skills first. So I think this will be a lesson for our students. Uh, sir, one last question that I'll be asking after that, students will ask their doubts. So what is your vision for the students in India towards STEM careers, especially for the girl students? So I think it's a very good question. And um, I'm happy to say that, um, and one of the reasons I came back to India after working for 25 years abroad is that I thought that this is the time when um, Indian science is really taking off. STEM careers, in, for students who are trained in India and who work in India is now poised to become really wonderful for many reasons. One of them is that there are quite a lot of facilities now uh, that um, people working in India have access to, not just abroad, but also on Indian soil. Uh, over the years, the governments have worked together to start building facilities within India and Indians Indian science has now joined hands with big facilities abroad. When I was a when I was a student, India was not part of any global science initiative. Even as a physicist, if you look at you know places like the Large Hadron Collider and CERN, where all the particle physics experiments go on, or in in global space initiatives, India was nowhere. India was not part. Now, not only are we members of CERN. Now, ISRO is launching world-class satellites 
and uh, and observatories and um, from India, as was mentioned at the very beginning, India is now part of some really global initiatives in um, in in science. For example, ITER, which is the uh, fusion um, experiment where energy from fusion is being generated. It is based in France, but it's an international research project, and India is part of it. And the Indian government is paying a lot of money for India to be part of it. And Indian students and researchers are part of it. This is uh, this is in physics. Uh, in nuclear physics, in astrophysics, we have the 30 meter telescope, we have the LIGO, as was mentioned before, the gravitational wave observatory, which was now being um, uh, uh, approved by the government to be built in Maharashtra. Uh, the, uh, the 30 meter telescope will be built in Hawaii, India is part of it with America, Canada, Japan and China. And then uh, there's a square kilometer array, which is the radio telescope uh, um, experiment uh, based in South Africa and Australia, and India is part of that, 20 other countries. So, uh, so Indian astronomers and physicists are working with this all over the world, and I'm talking about just my subject. This is everywhere. Now, not only that, the facilities like LIGO are being built in India. The giant meter wave radio telescope outside Pune, GMRT, has been there for more than 20 years, and it, for a long time, was the largest radio telescope in the world, built entirely in India by Indians. And when I worked in England, I used to come to India to work that with that telescope. So there are amazing facilities in India now for Indian astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists to use STEM all over the place. Now, uh, and I'm talking mostly about astronomy because that's my subject, but this happens in other subjects. Side by side, education in STEM is now taking off everywhere. Universities are, are very, very strong in STEM subjects now, uh, and partly because of uh, um, this attention to STEM education, as you see in the Navodaya Vidyalaya is now, but coming up into the universities in the, um, in, in, uh, um, uh, and, and people are, are now interacting more and more with, uh, with, with scientists. So for example, this kind of a thing would not have been possible when I was a school student, right? Also, you wouldn't have met any, I didn't meet any scientists in school. The first scientist I met was when, uh, as part of my scholarship, I was taken to Bangalore, where I said. So that is the great thing. So this opens up the promise for girl students. Right now, in science, in some of the sciences, in physics and mathematics and chemistry, about 25% of students at the university level are, are women, are girls. In biology, the number is higher. And this is the same as global uh, averages. So it's, it's the same in America, same in England, same in India. But what is happening in India is, as you know, um, the large, the, India has the largest number of young people below the age of 21. And this is going to grow. Below the age of 25, India will have the largest, for a long time, the largest young population because in other, other countries, the population is actually declining. And this means that more opportunities will, will grow up for young people and half the young people are, are women. So I think the educational opportunities for girl students is wonderful. The, all the science opportunities that I'm talking of will be available to everybody, men and women. And um, the opportunities are there. All we want to do is to convince you the people there sitting in the class, that science is there for the taking for everybody in the country. And in the future, in 10, 20 years, people from abroad will come to India to do science, as we in our generation went abroad to, to become scientists, right? Already this is happening. I'm sitting at a university where we have hundreds of foreign students. I have colleagues who are foreign nationals who have come to India to teach in a university. This is already happening. And you'll take part in this whole thing uh, sitting in India. Thanks, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. That was very encouraging and uh, for our students also. But uh, now I would like our students to ask the questions. So uh, first of all, Ms. Sanjana with, Sarjana with Biswas from JNB Murshidabad. She's from class two. So, Sarjana, you can ask a question. Good afternoon, ma'am. Myself, Sarjana Bishwas. 
of class Hello. 12 science from Chennai Murshidabad. Sir, sir, I want to ask a question. In simple term, can you explain us to the concept of black holes, especially the difference between the stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes? Okay. So that's a very, very, very good question. Uh, let me um, uh, let me uh, start with what black holes are. So uh, what black holes are are they are they are stars, but um, they are stars from which light cannot escape. So think about you must have learned in school about the concept of escape velocity. So what happens is that if you have something that has gravity like the Earth or the Sun, you need a certain amount of velocity which in terms of kinetic energy, you need some kinetic energy, which corresponds to a certain velocity, which you need the minimum amount of velocity to escape from that object, right? So from the earth, uh, you can jump up and you'll come down. That is because you don't have the velocity to escape, but for a rocket to escape, you need that kind of velocity, right? So you need many thousands of uh, uh, kilometers per hour in order to uh, escape from the earth. And you can work that out from Newton's laws. And I don't know whether you know the formula. It is square root of 2 gm over r for a spherical object, right? So m being the mass of the object and r being the radius of the object. So if you uh, put in um, earth's uh, mass and earth's radius in there, you will get the escape velocity. Now, that velocity gives you the amount of uh, uh, velocity you need to escape from the earth so rockets need that. No? So here's Chandrayaan is going to the moon. So you need to find that velocity so that you can escape. Now, what, ha what happens if, if the Earth with the same mass became smaller? Then, because the formula has m divided by r, r becomes smaller, which means that velocity becomes larger. So the object, as it becomes smaller and smaller, the velocity needed to escape from it becomes larger and larger and larger. Okay. And, and then finally, <clears throat> the, the velocity can be more than the speed of light. What you probably know is that there can be no velocity more than the speed of light. So if the escape velocity from a certain object is more than the speed of light, even light cannot escape, nothing can escape. That is called a black hole. So we can we worked out and of course you can't work it from newton's uh, laws of physics you need uh, the einstein's uh, way of looking at gravity which is called the general theory of relativity to work this out but it turns out that anybody can turn into a black hole you can turn into a black hole too but i need to make you so small that m over r that the escape velocity from you has to more, be more than the speed of light so for the sun um, that is uh, if you take the sun and make it into a ball that is three kilometers, it becomes a black hole. It will never become a black hole. For the earth, if you make it into a sphere that is a size one centimeter, it will become a black hole. But how will you do that? It turns out that stars, big stars, when they finish burning their fuel, which means, as you know, there's fusion going on in the middle of a star, from going from hydrogen to helium, and that produces all this light that you see. Once that finishes, a star can collapse. And as it collapses, large star can, can become something that's smaller than a few kilometers. And then that M over R ratio that there is in that escape velocity formula makes it very high and it, escape velocity can be more than the speed of light. And so it can turn into a black hole. So, um, this was, of course, Stephen Hawking and others worked this out. Uh, actually, it was originally worked out by the Indian astronomer physicist S. Chandrasekhar in the 1930s. And this is why the NASA uh, mission I was talking about to find black holes was named after him. So Chandrasekhar worked this out in the 1930s that stars will collapse and form these black holes. So stellar mass black holes are black holes that are formed from stars collapsing. And so we have found these stellar mass black holes all over our galaxy, um, and uh, they can go up now to um, masses of uh, almost 150 times the mass of our sun, which means they're formed from stars that were much bigger than our sun, and they collapsed to form these black holes. Now, 
there is another, we also know of another kind of black hole which exists in the middle of our galaxy. I showed you the picture of the Milky Way galaxy right in the middle, there is a, a, a black hole and these are called supermassive black holes. And these have crore, many crore times the mass of the sun, millions to billions times the mass of the sun. There are galaxies which have 5 billion times the mass of the sun, supermassive black holes sitting in the middle. And there's only one in one galaxy. There can be uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of stellar mass black holes in a galaxy. There are 10 to the power 10 stars in a galaxy and 10 to the power seven or eight times um, the, uh, you know, they, they could be uh, um, stellar mass black holes, but there's only one black hole in the middle of a galaxy, right in the middle, in our galaxy too, in the middle. And that is called a supermassive black hole. Now those can't be formed from a single star because there's no star that is so massive. So we don't know how they are formed, but they're found in the middle of each galaxy. And the discovery of the mass of our own galaxy, uh, the supermassive black hole in our own galaxy led to the Nobel Prize, as you know, uh, won by a woman, by the way, Andrea Ghez, uh, two years ago, who measured the mass in the middle of our galaxy. And, and, and so uh, that itself is a wonderful discovery. So this is the difference between the two, and it's also a, a wonderful subject of, um, uh, of, of uh, research. And I work on both supermassive black holes and stellar mass black holes in many ways from space and from the earth. Uh, it's, it's something that when you grow up to become scientists yourself, you will find it's going to be a very, very active um, uh, area of research, trying to understand not only how these things form, but how these things behave, how these things grow, and how do supermassive black holes form? This is a very open question. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you, sir. So our second student is Miss Nilakshi Bhagat, class 12, JMB Doda, Kashmir. Hello. Hi, Nilakshi. Hi, Nilakshi. Good afternoon, sir. So I'm Nilakshi Bhagat from JMB Doda. So here is my question for you that, as you all are very excited about our country's mission, Chandrayaan 3, we want to know the main objective and different stages of this mission. Right. So that, that's, that's oh, of course, it's the most, most, most uh, um, uh, exciting time for us. Chandrayaan 3 was launched, as you know, last week. And, um, and uh, there, um, uh, this is following up from Chandrayaan 2, which was launched in um, uh, uh, four years ago, but uh, uh, the, uh, the idea is that um, this mission, uh, as you know now, is uh, in an orbit around the Earth. It is uh, not, it hasn't attained this escape velocity I was talking about yet. To attain escape velocity, you can't just go shoop out from the Earth. It takes a lot of fuel. So what you do is you go up in orbits that uh, increase slowly, and these are elliptical orbits with the Earth in focus. So it goes, it becomes larger and larger and larger. And it will go up to something like 250 kilometers uh, from the earth at one end and um, quite a lot, about 30,000 kilometers or so at the other. And these will become uh, large ellipses and then it will transfer to an orbit around the moon. And there it will start with a very large orbit and slowly uh, that orbit will shrink to down to coming as close as 100 kilometers to the moon. And from that, a lander will land on the moon. This is the whole point. In Chandrayaan 2, the lander was part of the mission. There were eight instruments on the Chandrayaan 2 itself, which is the, the thing that orbits the moon and is still orbiting the moon. It is now doing a lot of uh, experiments and sending us data. But uh, it, uh, the, uh, the um, Vikram lander, uh, which uh, it tried to land on the surface of the moon in 2019, uh, as you know, did not land properly and crashed. And so this year, the main focus has been not the orbiter. There's only one instrument on the orbiter, but the lander is the main instrument and it's going to land. Now, the idea is to land near the South Pole of the moon, which nobody has la landed before. Before this, only three countries have landed anything on the surface of the moon, and that is India, so in, in USA, Russia, and China. And they've brought back things from the moon but um, we are planning to land and they've all landed in the northern part of the moon. In the southern, what's so special about the southern part of the moon 
and that is in the southern part of the moon there are very high mountains and very deep craters and so there are a lot of places which are shadowed permanently so sun's rays don't reach there there are some parts there which have temperatures that is as low as minus 200 degrees and in these temperatures there are lots of chemicals which are in solid form these are gases and in particular there is water we know that there is water chandrayaan 2 in the instruments from the orbiter has measured and shown the great evidence for water to be there in in all over the moon now we have to find where this water is and we think that it is in the southern hemisphere in these dark areas where sunlight does not reach in form of ice and this is why we are going to the southern part of the moon which is also largely unexplored you know even on earth uh, you know going first into the southern hemisphere going into africa going into southern america was a big thing for our explorers here we are going to the southern part of the moon and there we not only hope to find water but other chemicals as well other minerals that people have not found before and another there's another reason for it and this is you know the earth and the moon formed at the same time from the same nebula when the sun was forming and so by by actually studying the moon and so when it formed they formed in a very fluid form and then they solidified so a lot of the layers are mixed up in the moon compared to the earth so there are things that are near the surface of the moon that are deep below the surface of the earth so there are lots of things you can find on the moon that you can't find on the earth because you have to dig very deep some minerals for example which are on the surface so and the second thing is also studying this makes us also understand how the earth formed so people who are uh, very interested in the earth are studying the moon to know earth better so that is another reason why we are exploring the moon so much to find out how the moon formed it is easier to understand and so if our rover uh, and lander lands and i'm very uh, hopeful it will because uh, for the last four years we've studied what went wrong last time and uh, a lot of people have put their minds together and figured out there were so many difficulties and and they've all been corrected now and so we hope fingers crossed that it's going to land on the 23rd of august and then from that for 14 days which is one lunar day one one sun uh, moon's one day is one um, 14 days long there will be these experiments uh, where the um, the rover will go around and and look at various parts of the southern hemisphere of the moon and we'll get data from it so that's very very exciting uh, and uh, i'm really looking forward to it wonderful wonderful experiment thank you sir and yes we all are looking forward for this so let's see uh, so our third question is from a student named miss reena saini she is from class 12 jnv junjunu rajasthan hi reena hi reena evening sir i am reena saini from jnv then we do this. sir we have sir. read we have read that you were among the key people to start the indian astronomy olympiad can you please tell us more about the initiative and the experience surrounding that okay thank you well that's that's interesting yeah so <laughs> so that uh, there are just like there are olympics in games in all subjects there are olympiads which are happen all over the world and countries uh, participate so there's a physics olympiad the biology olympiad mathematics olympiad and india does very well in them in the 1990s when i worked at iuka in pune uh, there was only one astronomy olympiad that was held in the russian countries at that time and uh, um, uh, outside russia not many people were uh, participating in it but there was the only astronomy olympiad so um, i first organized a team I trained a team from Pune to send to the first Olympiad in Moscow. Uh, in, and then uh, um, uh, we uh, actually got uh, ISRO to um, uh, fund the, um, the Olympiad, the trips of the students as well as the teachers who went to compete. And they did very well. They um, got a gold medal and some silver medals. And uh, so we thought this would be a very interesting uh, way to start an Olympiad in India. So the next year, we had uh, an internal Indian Olympiad, which was held in about 25 different cities 
uh, and the planetariums uh, and science centers in the cities held examinations for us and selected students. And then we brought them together in a camp in Khandala for three weeks and trained them. And we also got quite a lot of books from Russia to figure out what kind of questions are asked in this Olympiad. This is not just sit down exams, but there were exams to do with telescopes and uh, experiments and things like that. And uh, India that year got a couple of gold medals. And uh, so it all started and ISRO got interested in giving us money. The next year, India became the champion, uh, getting three gold medals. And uh, it was held in the Ukraine, in Kiev, with the war going on now. This was, I'm talking of the year 1999-2000. Since then, the um, Olympiad was handed over, all Olympiads were handed over to the Homi Bhabha Center in Mumbai now, which runs all the camps for all the Olympiads, not just astronomy, but the physics, chemistry, biology, science Olympiads. And I, I hope some of you have uh, participated in the exams and taken part in their exercises. And India does very well now. It's been a long time and I was very, I still teach in the, uh, in the astronomy Olympiad camp. Uh, and uh, I've been very happy to be associated with from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, now this last question. Uh, this is from a student named Palak Bukhari. She is from JNB Gandharwal. Good evening, sir. I am Fala Bukhari from JNV Gandharwal, Jammu and Kashmir. My question is, what is the scope and significance of technology like coding and machine learning in astronomical studies? Good. So, absolutely. And that is, you know, machine learning, of course, and artificial intelligence is a big thing now. And uh, uh, it provides a way of um, very intelligently doing work in with large data sets uh, in an automated way so that humans don't have to be involved. So in, in the early days of astronomy, because we are dealing with, you know, I mean, we are, in astronomy, we deal with millions and billions of objects. There's so many stars in the sky. There are so many galaxies in the universe. And if you want to study them, say you take pictures of the sky. In, in astronomy, you can't go to the, the stars and touch them and do experiments with them. You have to depend on the light that comes from them, right? And light can come in different forms. There can be infrared light, there can be ultraviolet light, there can be normal light, X-ray, etc. So there, you can build telescopes and instruments to study these things in different kinds of uh, light. And you take pictures, you take spectra, a lot of information comes and this can come from millions and billions of objects, right? And in traditionally what has happened in, in astronomy and other sciences in astronomy in particular is that people have sat down and there have been students who've studied pictures of the sky and tried to pick out things that are unusual and this is how things have been discovered so pulsars have been discovered quasars have been discovered different galaxies have been discovered but there are all these things that and there are how many astronomers are there in the universe there, i mean in the in the in the entire earth there are probably you know 10000 astronomers who um, uh, at, at all levels, students and, and professionals at various universities. But there are billions of objects. So one needs to do things in an automated way. And this is where artificial intelligence and machine learning becomes very important. So what you can do is you can train machine learning programs to find unusual objects. To, um, you can train machine learning programs to classify objects. To, For example, if you are given billions of galaxies, they can tell you there are four different types of galaxies. Now. Uh, this can be very nicely done in machine learning programs. And we're trying to train them. And, and then as you train uh, machine learning algorithms to do such things, it can also uh, tell you what is the best way of training these things. So computer science is giving us this tool, but uh, the data is coming from astronomy. And then for each object, if you have different kinds of information coming from different kinds of telescopes, putting them together, and trying to understand them is another very interesting exercise that can be automated. And now the productivity of, um, of trying to learn uh, different kinds of things in the universe has increased a lot uh, due to the use of machine learning. So here is a very good example where universities like uh, the one I am in, for example, where you can bring together um, people um, uh, from different disciplines uh, to work on the same thing is very important. So 
here uh, in Ashoka University, for example, we have the computer science department working with economics people to look at machine learning applications in economics. We're working with people who are in chemistry or biology or, or physics to work on uh, artificial intelligence uh, applications. And here, uh, the computer scientists and astronomers are working together so that we can look at um, how we can understand systems uh, uh, through machine learning. So doctors can uh, look at, for example, the EEG and ECG patterns uh, and try to find out um, what the underlying disease is. A, a, a black hole has a disk around it and it sends out X-ray pulses, which are very similar to the EEG pulses. And it tells you by the same machine learning methods, what the nature of the black hole is. And the mathematics and the, the actual program is identical. The data is different. One is a, a data from a patient and another in a hospital, and another is a data through an X-ray telescope coming from a black hole. So very interestingly, um, AI, ML, uh, this kind of machine learning things can, can also show you the, the, the similarities of the, the different methods and the different data sets. So this is a very important uh, subject. And you would find that as you learn more and more um, astronomy, astrophysics, and also if you are interested in machine learning, uh, they, they, you would, in the next 100 years, this would be a, a major subject emerging. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pala. Thank you so much, sir, for addressing the doubt of our, of our students. And now I'd like to invite Ms. Jessly from American India Foundation to give a vote of thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, it was a beautiful session. Thank you so much, sir. And the session was uh, packed with information and the pictures or photos you shared, it was breathtaking, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful experience. Uh, so now I take this opportunity to thank uh, Gopal Krishna, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your continuous appreciation and encouragement. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I thank our dear Modi, sir, and Minu, ma'am, for your help and all the support. Thank you so much. Last but not the least, I thank all our dear students and teachers because without you, this program is not a success. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you very much for attending this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.